say we're going to be talking about cervical spine, cervical neck with radiating pain. All right. So again, a segue from a couple of weeks ago when we talked about low back pain with leg pain. All right. Um, most of the information will come from the guidelines. So they initially did a one in 2014, and then they did a revision um, in 2017 to kind of make some changes. Quick question, Chris. When I pull this, can you see the participants thing on my screen? You just yes, see that. Yes, I can. Oh, you can see all the people's name and everything. No, sorry, you cannot. Okay, cool. No. All right, you just see the PowerPoint. Yeah, awesome. you're good to roll. Okay, cool. All right, so that's kind of what we are talking about. So if I click here, all right. So under Physio U, if I click on clinical pattern recognition, all right, go out to neck. That would be the best place to put this. Maybe right there. Okay. All right. And if we go down, so body chart, right? It's kind of easy, right? If we're talking about radiating arm pain, right? We're looking for the guy that has pain radiating down the arm. When would be an example of um, a time where we might miss that someone has radiating arm pain? You guys think of an example of you've had a patient in the clinic or um, just think of maybe looking at uh, chart reviews and stuff where maybe you might miss that someone has radiating arm pain. If someone walks in and says that they have neck pain and then pain going down their arm, right away our brain kind of goes to, oh, some type of cervical spine thing, radiating arm pain. How about the people that come in that just have kind of like shoulder pain, upper arm pain, maybe like deltoid or stuff like that, right? That can often be a shoulder pathology, right? It can be localized to the shoulder, radiating down, but also it can be just like someone can have buttock pain and leg pain, and not have back pain, but it's coming from the back people can have shoulder pain, arm pain, without having neck pain, right? Majority of the time, it comes with neck, right? But we can also have times where you don't have it. So you may choose, you may not, it may not be on your radar to look at cervical, cervical spine, or think of that radiating arm pain, you might think of more of it's a shoulder pathology, right? So, okay, so we click on that, right? Kind of two, two different things pop up, cervical radic, we're, possibly, we're gonna follow that. Right. So most commonly, right, most commonly we see, it's seen in middle-aged, right? Um, incidences in men a little bit more than women, right? Some of the main reasons people get uh, radiating arm pain would be because of either facets, so neuroforaminal, or because of discs being uh, irritated or herniated, right? Let me go back. All right, clinical findings. All right, so what do you guys think? All right, if someone's sitting in front of you, what do you think are going to be some of the key things that they're going to tell you in a subjective that will make you think that this person has a cervical radiculopathy? What are those key things? Not tests, think subjective information at this point. Radiating pain down past the elbow. Okay. Yep. So location, right? So pain that's going down the entire arm. We start to think of, all right, what are some what are some tissue sources that can actually go down the entire arm? Good. What else? Also, it comes and goes with different positions. Okay. And what would those positions be? What are some of those positions? Extension, side bend to affected side, and rotation to the affected side. Okay. So those those are I assume we're talking about cervical spine. So. Most of those are moving your neck, so closing down with side bend, rotation, extension. Um, yeah, so if someone's coming and saying, man, I have this pain in my arm, when do you notice it? I notice it when I'm looking up. I notice it when I'm turning, my sh turning over my shoulder. Right away, we start to think, oh, probably not a shoulder pathology and more likely a, a neck pathology. Right? How about uh, what do you expect might uh, be some things that make their pain better? What would be some eases? Lying supine. Yeah, lying down, definitely. Right, changing gravity on the on the neck. Right. We also receive cervical traction. Okay. Unloading. Yep. yep, unloading traction. Good. So again, things that directly affect the spine. Right. Some of the things that we'd expect them, if we're not quite sure, is it more of a? Let's say they don't have neck pain. It's more arm, shoulder, arm pain. And we're thinking, is it neck or shoulder? 
Um, some of the questions we can ask them are, does it hurt when you reach over your head? Does it hurt when you reach behind your back? Right, those are all shoulder things. And even though they have arm pain and shoulder pain, we'd expect them, if we're thinking that this is a neck problem, we'd expect them to say, nope, those don't bother me, right? Um, another big one is when someone comes in and they're like, yeah, I don't really know. It doesn't really hurt with movement. It just hurts when I'm sitting on the computer working. It hurts when I'm driving for a couple hours, right? What tends to bother us after prolonged positions? More peripheral joints or axial joints, right? A lot more of axial. So we think about low back pain, thoracic pain, neck pain. Um, the spinal column tends to be more painful at rest after time, right? So now if someone, it can be shoulder, hip, knee stuff, but that's more like, oh, when I get up out of the chair, I feel my knee. When I get up out of the, when I, I haven't moved my arm for an hour and then I go to reach, then it bothers me. That's totally fine. But people that just have pain at rest when they're not doing anything, you start to think about something about the spine, right? Because peripheral joints should hurt when you use them. If I'm not using my shoulder, it shouldn't bother me. Right? Think of your most irritable frozen shoulder. I had a very irritable frozen shoulder today. Right? She had maybe 50 degrees of flexion and I think maybe five degrees of external rotation by her side. Super painful. However, she didn't really have any pain at rest. Couldn't move it at all. 10 out of 10 within a second of it, but as soon as she brought it back down, it went away. Right? So very characteristic of um, more peripheral pain. Okay. So what about, right? What about our physical exam, right? So we've just listened to the guy talk about it hurts with his neck movements, doesn't really hurt much with their arm movements. We got a body chart that talks about location going past the shoulder, maybe past the elbow. Um, a common question we want to ask them is numbness, tingling, right? Those are very nervy qualities, right? Once we get to the physical exam, what would we expect? What would we expect to find during the physical exam? What are some key tests you'd want to do? The Wainer's cluster. Yeah, which is what? What are, what are the components of the Wainer cluster? Median nerve tension, spurling, cervical distraction. Good. Median nerve compression or spurling, distraction. There's one more. Anybody know the fourth one? 60, less than 60 degrees of rotation, cervical spine. Yep. To that side, right? So if it's my right side that's affected, less than 60 degrees of right rotation. Good. Right? So we talk about if we compress the spine, does it bring your pain on? If we distract the spine, does it make your pain better, right? So if somebody does not have pain at rest, right? If they, are, if they already have arm pain, they're sitting there and they have arm pain, we can use distraction, right? Oh, you have pain right now, it's a four. What happens when I go behind? What happens if I lift your head, if I traction, distract your neck? What happens to your pain? It feels better, positive test. How about if someone doesn't have any pain at rest? That they're just sitting there, right? A positive test means the pain gets better. They don't have any pain to start with. How can we use that test to, to see if it's positive or negative? Make them hurt. Okay. And what would we expect to be something that would hurt? Based on that cluster, maybe. Quadrant. Quadrant, right? Maybe, even, maybe less aggressive than that would just be the right rotation, right? If someone has right rotation and it hurts, painful, right? Put them in that position and then give them some traction, right? But same thing as quadrant. If you put them back in the quadrant, oh yeah, there's my arm pain. What happens if I distract? It feels better, right? There's my positive test. Good, All right? Uh, spurlings, right? That's your side bend and then you compress, right? For someone who has low irritability, so they don't really get their symptoms unless they've been driving for an hour, um, Maybe just at the end of the day, after being busy all day, they get it. Um, how, what can we do with spurlings? If we initially push on it, nothing changes. And we say, you know, I don't think it's that it's a negative test. I just think it doesn't match this person's irritability. What can we do with that to get a positive test? Push harder with the question mark? Nice. Yeah. So one is we can add more force, right? The other thing we can do is hold it longer, right? So there's some studies that talk about initially you do, you do a six second hold, you do a six second hold, see what happens. If nothing happens, you can then increase it and do a, a 30 second hold, right? So, okay. Um, another one looks at where they had them, they did six pressures, right? So more repetitions, right? So they're really trying to make sure they don't miss it. 
Now, if you do it once, you get symptoms. Do you have to really do it six more times? No, All right? You already got your answer. So realize you have the ability to ramp it up. Good. All right, so that would be our radiculopathy cluster, right? Rotation, upper limb, spurlings, distraction. All right, good. Um, spurlings can be done from behind, but it also can be done from in front, All right? What do you think there is a, can anybody think of a reason why you might do spurlings from in front versus behind? Danielle says patient awareness. Good, yeah. Um, if I asked you to be a little bit more specific, but what do you, what do you mean by patient awareness? Raza says patient trust. Okay, patient trust, yeah. Right. Think of if we're dealing at the cervical spine, right, and someone's having radiating pain, right, and kind of in the back of our mind, we're thinking about red flags, right? So you think about your five N's and your, or your D's and your N's. Um, so it's, it's the ability to look at someone in the eyes when we're doing some of these maybe more aggressive cervical th spine tests to say, do they get a nystagmus? Are they able to talk to you, right? So it's kind of like a, Sperling's it's a little bit like a VBI if you think about it, right? You're rotated, your side banks and compression. So it's kind of gives you the ability to just make sure you're a little bit, you have a little safety check, right? If you think that someone might have a positive VBI, you should probably do that test first before you ever do a Sperling's, right? Have them just actively move their neck, see if it's, before you think about compressing it. Good, okay. So that's part, of our, that's part of our key findings, right? This radiculopathy cluster. The other part of our key findings is still looking at the rest of cervical range of motion, right? Because we wanna make sure that, I think you guys already said it, but the pattern would be hurts when I extend, hurts when I maybe side bend, not just rotation, even though rotation is the one considered in that. Okay. Um, what else would be part of our exam? What else would be something I'd probably wanna do on day one eval? if someone has radiating pain. What did you guys hear? All right, wanna do a neuro exam, All right? So reflexes, dermatomes, myotomes, All right? Good, so important for safety, right? Is this patient safe to treat today or is it someone I should refer out? And what do you think would, what do you think would determine if I'm doing a neuro exam, what do you think would, would determine if I treat this person right now, maybe I refer out and treat the person, or maybe I said, you know what, you should probably go see someone right now. Um, what, are, what do you think I would hang my hat on, I guess? A Hoffman sign? Okay, so if I'm doing an upper motor neuron, yeah. So definitely if I'm, Let's say I'm going through and doing um, my myotomes and I kind of take the person into wrist flexion and all of a sudden I feel like a bunch of clonuses or I decide to do a Hoffman's, right? Where you flick the finger and all of a sudden um, I see motions like, yeah, that's someone that if they don't, if they have not been checked out for an upper motor neuron lesion, definitely that's someone I would probably refer out right away, call the neurologist and try to get that person in, all right? Um, Al good. also says if symptoms change in your exam. Okay. So... If I, if symptoms like what, what would be the symptoms? And the reason why I'm pushing, there's kind of something specific I'm looking for. Vertebral artery compromise. Okay. So definitely if, if I'm doing a VBI test and someone's positive, that's someone I'm not going to treat, right? I'm going to refer him out without treating that person. Uh, but if I'm doing a neuro exam, so if I'm doing myotomes, dermatomes, reflexes, right? If someone has positive dermatomes, so they have numbness, tingling, decreased sensation, do I need to refer that person out or can I treat that person? Can treat. Yeah, we treat people with numbness all the time, right? We treat people with decreased sensation, right? Remember, sensation is the most outer part of the nerve, right? Vibration, temperature, that's all the outer part. So the nerve can be barely brushed on. The nerve can have a little inflammation in it and you're gonna to start to get sensation changes. So that's not worrisome. Um, so of the two that are left, right, is there something that might be more worrisome? You mentioned earlier was nystagmus. Okay, so nystagmus would fit more into our upper motor neuron, so like the VBI stuff and ends and these. If I'm thinking about lower, lower neuron, so myotomes, reflexes, right? If I'm checking someone's reflex, 
and they don't have a reflex, they have an absent reflex. And then myotomes, maybe I'm doing wrist and they are like a, a two, they barely have uh, maybe trace or a little bit, they can't even go against gravity, a lot of weakness. What do we think is the integrity of that nerve? It's probably pretty compromised. Right? If, if, think of someone with a drop foot. If someone comes into the clinic and says, you know, I just started noticing my foot drop yesterday. I can't pick my foot up. It's just dragging on the floor. Right? We're probably going to refer that person out. Right? Right? That nerve is being compressed so much, it's not getting nutrients. And there is a, le there is a limit. Right? If, if a nerve is compressed for so long without enough oxygen and blood flow, right, it can possibly not grow back as well. Right? So our job during the neuro exam is to make sure, hey, are there reflexes? Do they have a reflex, right? Are they, even if they have some weakness, okay, but are they severely weak? Where I'm saying this nerve is pretty compromised, you should go see neuro, right? Um, good, okay. So neuro exam, range of motion, and then our mobility of the nerve and then some special tests, right, good. How about if we progress from maybe not our key findings, but more to movement faults, right? We have some movement, so. Not necessarily things that bring on pain, but things that may be the reason why somebody hurts, right? So I'm gonna switch gears for a second. All right, so I go to this PowerPoint, right? Talk about prevalence, our key findings, right? We talked about the radiculopathy cluster, the mobility assessment, and then our neuro exam, right? Good job. Our movement faults, there's four main ones, right? Two of them are the neck, right? So if someone is always hanging out in extension, right? Their neck is always extended that will close down and put pressure on the intervertebral space. I know I put some in, right? The other thing is if someone is always hanging out in rotation or side bend, like they're closing down that side constantly, right? Then that can also put irritation on the neck. So think of, think of different positions or demographics or um, careers that someone may be hanging out in extension a lot, right? What would be an example of someone who may just be always in extension. I can't think over of overhead construction workers, cyclists, and surfers. Perfect. Yeah, anyone's always lifting their head up. So if I have to work around an electrician, a, a carpenter, um, construction worker, anyone who's lifting their head up for a long period of time, definitely. If I have to lift something up and I'm looking up, now you think about you're going to fire all of these muscles your upper trap, your levator, all these muscles are firing and you're extending, you're gonna get compression from below and above. Yep, the surfers and the, um, I can't remember, the, what was the other one they said? Cyclists. Cyclists, yeah. Those are people that are there for a while, right? It's not like you look up for a second, right? It's not washing your hair in the shower for a second. It's you're there for a while in these positions um, that can definitely close on. How about, so good job. How about the rotation, cervical, Rotation, if someone's always in rotation or side bend, that's just their posture they hang out in. Why would they choose to do that? They're either a driver or a violin player. Okay, yeah, so maybe it's a musical instrument where they're there for hours at a time. Um, positioning, they're always having to turn their head if they reverse a lot, they're always looking over one shoulder. Um, people who don't use earphones, headsets, they have more of the, they're on the phone, they have to type and hold it, they're always side bent. Um, think about, I don't know how many patients you guys have seen, but, um, I could, there's a lot of patients that wake up with neck pain, radiating pain, because when they sleep, their head is in a weird position. So they're, they may have too many pillows pushing over the side bend. They may have no pillows. Um, a common one is people who are on their stomach. They're in full rotation and then they put a pillow under their head. So now I'm in, I'm in rotation and extension and I do that for six, seven hours. Right, they wake up and like, man, my neck just hurt. I don't know why. And then as the day went on, my arm was hurting. So that's another common one I hear. Um, so normally my question is, oh, how do you normally sleep? Show me how you sleep. Good. Admit those people. Good. Okay. So that would be our extension rotation. How about how can you guys can you guys make a case for why thoracic kyphosis may be considered a movement fault for someone with um, neck pain, radiating pain? Why would we ever look at the thoracic spine? Movement, movements of the neck, it's then the T4. Okay, yep, so 
when I move, I should have motion down through my upper thoracic. Right? If my upper thoracic is always curved forward, right? So if we think about the max we should have is 40 degrees. If I'm in a little bit of kyphosis, right? And my cervical spine was neutral, that means my eyes are looking down, right? We don't really look at the ground. We try to look up. So that means if you think about it, if this is a lot of kyphosis, what is my angle, right? My CT junction angle, right? Can be close to 70, 80 degrees, right? Um, and the nice thing is there's actually a test where you can measure, one, you can measure someone's thoracic extension mobility, um, which is nice to get an objective measure, but you can actually measure someone's CT junction angle, right? With a goniometer that sits at like C7, right? The movement arms at C7. And then the other one goes through the external auditory meatus and you can look at the angle of it. And obviously the more 90 degree angle, the better. The more forward angle like that, the worse it is. Um, but it's good because these are things we can say, hey, if we're gonna work on this with a patient and we're gonna try to get them to correct it, um, we can measure to see if it's gotten any better. It's good, All right? Um, okay, and then the last one would be scapular depression, right? So if someone's scapula is hanging below, right, T2 to T7, we think that would be the normal resting position of a scapula. If it's hanging down low, that means there's more tension on upper trapezius, levator, all the muscles that attach to the cervical spine, pulling down on the cervical spine, right? So that can add more compression to those intervertebral joints. All right, so, so four kind of movement faults, right? If we think of extension, the first one, the most common one, right? We wanna be able to say anytime there's a movement fault that we think is associated, the idea is, well, actually, let me ask you guys. If, if you think someone has a movement fault related to their pain, right, how would you rule that in? Like, what would be the things or what would be the, the theory behind proving that someone has a movement fault affecting their pain? When you correct the fault and see if the symptoms reduce. Perfect. Yeah. So, so here, if someone has, if someone is hanging out in cervical extension, right, we're sitting down doing our subjective, we're talking with them and they have resting pain, right? If I have them do a little bit of a chin tuck, maybe lift the back of their neck, right? Lift the back of their neck to elongate, right? And say, hey, what happens when you do that? Oh, my patient, my, my symptoms feel better. Fantastic, right? I already now have an idea of what I may work on later on, or at least I know what impairments to look at on the table, right? So if someone, this is their resting posture, it hurts. If you do this, you elongate here and you bring this down, they feel better, right? What test may you want to look at later on in the exam? What impairment test would we want to look at? Deep neck flexor endurance. Fantastic, yeah, right. So the deep neck flexor, their job is to keep our neck back a little bit, right? What would be another test? Right. I'm asking this guy to elongate the back of his neck and it feels better, but he says, man, that's hard to do. All right. This is just so much more comfortable. So about occipitals or chin tuck? Exactly. Yeah. So we'd want to look at the mobility of the back. Do they have the ability to come out of extension into more of a neutral spine position? which can be limited by suboccipital muscles. All right, so they're good. All right, so we have just looking at someone's posture and changing it. Does that improve their symptoms? We can then watch them look up, right? And I think as you guys already said, when people look up, we should get mobility from, from C2, C1, C2, all the way down to T4, right? Not as much as at T3, T4 as we do as other places, right? Obviously, lower cervical is the most mobile. Um, but if someone is just hinging, all at that lower cervical and it's painful and we see a big crease, right? If everybody flexes their elbow, you should see like you get a big crease where your elbow moves, right? If all the motion is at one segment and that's the nerve is getting irritated, we wanna kind of disperse, right? Disperse the forces. Um, I often use the example with patients in the clinic. If you work on a factory line and there's four of you, right? And three of them call out sick, that one person's doing everything. Right? So same thing, we don't want that one joint to do everything. We want motion to come from other places. Right? So we want to correct it. What happens if you sit up tall? What happens if I do a little bit of a snag? I force you to move at T1, 2, or maybe even T2, 3, or C2, 3. Like, does that change your pain? Oh, it feels better. Great. 
check another positive test for an extension fault right you guys already talked about deep neck flexors right before we actually check the strength i'm just going to ask that person hey lift your head off the table right and ideally what should happen if i'm have someone laying supine and i said hey lift your head off the table what should be the first thing that happens Where should they initiate the motion from? Flexion at OA. Yep. Yeah, so it should be OC1 flexion followed by the rest. Good. So some patients that have this extension fault that for no reason, it's just, it's just how they move, they'll just extend their head to lift it up. So they go into extension before they lift it. Often it's painful. I then kind of say a little bit like, oh, I'm kind of glad it's painful because then now I can correct it and have you do it again, see if it's better. All right, good. So those are some of the common ones. How about rotation, right? Rotation, you think it's the same thing. If someone's showing us this posture, can we correct it? We wanna look at someone raise their arm above their head, right? Someone who has, oh, let me let somebody in the room. Somebody who has a rotation movement fault, right? As they raise their arm, think about all these muscles are firing, your upper trap, your levator, Things are getting pulled on, things are being tensed, things are being having tension put on. You may get some type of cervical rotation, right? Is that normal? No. When I raise my arm, my neck should be stable, right? Think about the person that sometimes if they raise both arms, right, it's no longer their neck moves. Where do people compensate when they raise both arms? They don't have either good strength or they don't have good mobility. What do we see them do? T extension yeah it'd be nice if it was t-spine extension only but what tends to happen is people go into a big lumbar extension right or people go into cervical flexion right so you see people they're trying to raise their arm above their head and when they get to where their arms get a little stiff instead of keep going they end up just putting their head forward right because it makes it seem like your arms are going further right and then they get pain right so so we want to look at unilateral flexion see what happens right one of the common corrections for someone who has a rotation fault is that their scapula is depressed. So we have them rotate, ouch, that hurts. If I unload it and rotate again, ah, oh, that feels better, right? So it kind of gives us an idea of um, what movement fault they may have. Good. All right. All right, next one, thoracic kyphosis, right? So this was the third movement fault we talked about. So someone who's hanging out in kyphosis, easiest correction is if they have pain at rest, force their T-spine into extension. If they don't have pain at rest, save it, right? Make them show you something that hurts. So whether it's rotation, whether it's extension, find some asterisk sign, and then extend their T-spine, see what happens, right? Does it make their pain better, right? If that's the case, if someone has really limited thoracic spine, they're stuck in flexion, it feels better when you lift them up, what are some of the impairment tests you might wanna look at later on in the exam? TOS, pet minor lane. Good, good. So there's definitely muscles that can pull us forward, right? So that pec minor, pec major, right? Pec major, major attaches to the humerus. So if, I, if it internally rotates my arms, then that's going to pull me into kyphosis. Same thing, same thing with the lats, right? If the lats are really stiff, they attach to the humerus and that can pull me into flexion, right? Um, TOS, we think of, it, it's a diagnosis that could be associated with kyphosis, but it wouldn't necessarily be the reason why someone has kyphosis. It'd be more the other way around. If someone with a lot of kyphosis, they may have tight structures that could then cause TOS. Right? Someone say they also well, have mid and lower trap strength. Right, all right. Do we expect them to be strong or weak? Weak all across the board. Nice. Good. Yeah. All right. Those are the muscles that help keep the scapula. It pulled into a deduction, right? Maybe a posterior tilt, but those muscles also attach to the spine, right? This is my scapula, scapula spines in the middle, right? We often think of the scapular muscles, the mid trap, trap as scapular movers, right? But they attach to the, 
they attach to the spinous process, so they also can work on thoracic spine extension, right? What are our biggest thoracic spine extenders? Right. Someone's stuck in kyphosis, right? And I'm able to lift them out of it, meaning they actually have the mobility to get there, which is not common. Most times people are stuck there, right? We want to work on that, but they can get there. What muscles do I really want to strengthen to help hold them there? Your rector spinae? Yeah, totally, right? Sometimes we, we tend to shy away from rector spinae because they end up being these really big, sore muscles, right? You look at someone, you're like, oh man, those muscles are tonic. You push on them, they're painful. But think about the job they have to do. They're gonna to try to hold your spine up all day long without curling. And because they curl, right, now they become bigger, thicker, they're working harder at this lengthened position. So we wanna work on strengthening them at this shorter position, right? So um, yeah, and, and they're endurance muscles. So th those are tests like they have like an Edo test or Sorensen for the lower extremity, or for a lower back would be more Sorensen, but for the middle back, you have someone lay over two pillows and then just lift their, they just lift their upper trunk, their sternum comes off, but their lower back, they try not to extend from the lower back, try to just extend, right? They do it um, over a Swiss ball a lot. They'll have them put their hands behind their head and then just lift like one inch off a Swiss ball, right? Doesn't that look pretty similar to Sarman's test where you lie on your back and lift your scapulas one inch off the shoulder and hold it? It's the same thing for your paraspinals. It's a great way to have them work on that trunk endurance, right? Hard thing is it doesn't feel good, right? Those are one of the things where in the moment, the muscles are burning, they're aching, and you're trying to talk him through it to say, you know, hey, the stronger these are, the longer you'll be able to, the longer you'll be able to hold that position, right? Good, okay. All right, so next one, oh, we talked about scapular depression, so correcting it, looking at some type of cervical motion, unload it, looking at some type of shoulder motion, unload it, okay. All right, so where are we at so far, right? We've looked at our key findings to diagnose that someone has neck pain with radiating arm pain, right? The most common nerve is gonna be that median nerve, right? But, um, and that's kind of the catch-all. If you only have time to do one, right? We do our median nerve. But remember, there are the other ones, radial, ulnar. What would tell you, what would tell you which one to do or what would change the reason why maybe you wouldn't choose to do the catch-all median one, right? The cluster says do median, but why would you choose radial or ulnar? Location. Location of what? Or what location, I guess? Dermatomal pattern. Okay. So dermatomal pattern would be nerve root, right? And we think of that nerve root like five, six, seven, T1, right? So the median nerve kind of catches all of those a little bit right? So maybe not actually nerve root as much as like nerve distribution of the peripheral nerve, right? When we think dermatomes, right, the dermatomes are very much a nerve root. So C4, C5, C6, right? We have those locations, we check them, right? Um, versus median nerve is more of a peripheral nerve, radial nerve, peripheral nerve. So if I have a radial nerve irritation, where am I expected to feel my symptoms? Thumb or the index finger? Okay, thumb or index finger for radial. I would say that tends to be more median, right? Median would be thumb, kind of first two fingers. Posterior arm, posterior lateral forearm. Perfect, yeah. So back of the arm, back of the forearm, back of the hand, right? Fingertips, and that would be more of our radial. If, it, if someone complains of it, like not their palm, but like all their fingers tips, that could be radial as well. Radial can wrap around and catch it. Okay. How about ulnar? If I'm thinking ulnar. Pinky ring finger. Good. Pinky ring finger. All right. So now, now the idea is if I'm thinking median nerve and we think it's the neck, what would be the other common entrapment sites for the median nerve down the arm? Right. If I'm going to palpate and look for entrapment sites, what are the other common ones for the median nerve? Carpal tunnel. Good, so carpal tunnel is a big one. Yep, right behind cervical spine. Actually, probably above cervical spine in certain demographics, right? What else? 
Elbow, cubital tunnel. Yeah. So elbow is going to be more biceps, uh, biceps aponeurosis. So not necessarily cubital tunnel. That's a little too medial, but more of the anterior medial part of the elbow. Good. Pronator teres muscle. Yeah, exactly. Pronator teres, right? They have a syndrome called the pronator teres syndrome, where that median nerve gets stuck inside the pronator teres, right? Those are the people that are always using tools, power tools, screwdrivers, doing lots of rotation, vibration, that nerve gets irritated, okay? Good, right? The only other one would be um, your arcata struthers, right? So up, up eight centimeters up the arm, kind of in here, you can tunnel it, right? So that'd be your median, right? How about radial? What are the common entrapment sites for radial nerve? Below the supinator. Okay, so supinator, that's kind of like your pronator teres for the median, right? You got something called the supinator syndrome, right? What else? Radial head. Radial head, good. Think of one more proximal. Underneath the medial head of triceps. Good, yeah, so kind of this deltoid insertion where the triceps comes together, deltoid. Right, that's gonna show up on your boards when someone has a, a proximal third humerus fracture. I feel like every, my OCS, my NCS, sports, someone, someone with a proximal humerus fracture, and then what, uh, what muscle might be weak if they have a nerve lesion? So one, you have to know what nerve, oh, radial. And then two, you gotta know what muscles are affected by radial nerve. So it's gonna be your wrist extensors, right? So not your thumb, not, so it's kind of a, I don't know why that shows up all the time. I've never seen one in the clinic with a rate on their fault, but it's in all the things. Good. All right, so if we go back to here, all right, so our differentials, right, you guys said for median nerve, right, biceps aponeurosis, ligament and struthers, pronator teres, and carpal tunnel, right? Uh, oh, we skipped ulnar, sorry. I skipped out on your learning opportunity, guys, my bad. Right. Arcata struthers, cubital tunnel, right? Flexor carpial naris, Right, Guillain's canal, right? Here's your radial one where you have radial groove, radial head, supinator, arcata froche, right? So we have these different areas and we palpate. So if someone's having radiating arm pain and we do a full cervical exam and it doesn't bring it on, but yet their nerve exam brings it on. So A, they have radiating pain, they have a positive upper limb tension test, but they're, the most common place is the neck and it's, not, it's negative. We want to start to think of right, what peripheral entrapment site do they have, right? We kind of look at different ones there. Dr. Lamar, quick question with that. Yep. So when you are with your experience, when you're bringing someone into say a median nerve, a ulnar nerve, a radial nerve entrapment, or sorry, not entrapment, but neurodynamic test, mm -hmm. um, how specific is that test with um, when you, when you, you know, kind of wind them up and bring them up. How specific is that pain to a, a entrapment site location? Are, are they going to have like an entrapment site at Arcata? Through, uh, if they have like, let's say, you know, pain at, you know, Arcata Struthers, no. is it pretty specific when you kind of wind them up that the yeah. pain corresponds? Yeah. And just so, I, just so I make sure I understand, right? If yeah. I'm doing an upper limb tension test on someone and they yeah. get pain, is it going to hurt at the entrapment site? Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you this. When you do an upper limb tension test on someone, how many people, if they have a cervical radic, how many of it hurt at the neck? Or does it more hurt in the arm? More hurts in the arm, yeah. Exactly. So it often doesn't hurt where it's being compressed when you do those Got things. It. It's more the thing that's being pulled on. So yeah. it's going to hurt normally distal to where the entrapment site is. Got it. Right? Because that's the point that's being pulled too much. And our nerves are very sensitive to traction, especially if there's inflammation on the nerve. Right? So... You think about this nerves being compressed, it's probably a little irritated, inflamed, it's not sliding. So then when you do it, you're gonna feel it. So you may, you often don't feel it where it's entrapped at. I'd say the only one where I really feel it clean like that is cubital tunnel. Like if I do an ulnar upper limb tension test to ulnar and they have a cubital tunnel thing and they get stretched right over that, like people feel it in the elbow yeah. versus normally you might feel it more in the pinky with a typical test, right? Yeah. Yeah. So so what makes okay. it positive? What makes someone an upper limb tension test? If, if I wound up everybody, everyone's going to have symptoms eventually, right? It's normal to have nerve tension, right? Eventually everyone has to stop. So what makes it a positive test? Do 
changes in position. What do you What do you mean? I'm not sure what that means. We have more answers in regards to changes in position, symptoms change with position, side to side differences, reproduction of symptoms they come in for. Good, perfect. All right, so I'll play one of these. I'll mute it so you guys can't hear it. So, yes, yeah, so if we're doing an upper limb tension test, what we need to know is what the other side is. We need to know what this patient's norm is, right? So, for the median test, right, <clears throat> it's at least 90 degrees of abduction, anything from 90 to 120, right? Stabilize that part of the arm, max external rotation, right? We're gonna do max finger extension, thumb extension, wrist extension with supination. Right? And then we're asking every time we wind up something new, we say, any problem with there, any of your symptoms? And then now we're opening the arm and we're gonna see how far does that elbow extend, right? So normal is to be anywhere from zero extension to 30 degrees of flexion, right? So if someone's at 30, you can technically say, oh, that's relatively normal. If someone's at like 90 degrees, like, oh, I feel it there, you might start to say, all right, that's an abnormal test. But maybe that's just that person's norm. Let's look at the other side, okay? So now we have a norm. We know how much their elbow extended. We then compare it to the other side, right? And what makes it a positive test is there are 10 degrees difference compared to the other side. So if this side gets to 30, and this side's only getting to 40 degrees, we would say that's positive, check. Number two, does it reproduce their symptoms? So maybe they actually get to full 30, so they get to the same as the other side, but they're like, oh yeah, this brings on my arm pain. Whereas on this side, oh, I just felt pulling in my fingers. I felt a stretch. This was my pain, positive, right? So we can bring on their symptoms, check, or we can have a decrease in range compared to the other side, right? Um, one of the important things that with these nerve tests, right, as we're winding up tissue, right, if I have a shoulder pathology and I'm in flat abduction, external rotation, I'm yanking it, this might hurt my shoulder a little bit, right? right if, I'm doing, if I'm doing the radial, right, arms down here, right, and if most people are going to feel like a stretch in their wrist extensors. So we want to say, well, if I sensitize it, does that change? So I'll ask you guys, if I have a shoulder pathology, I have a labral problem, and I'm winding up into abduction, external rotation, like, ah, that, that hurts. That hurts my shoulder. That's my pain. But we're doing a nerve test. How do we know if it's positive or negative here? How do we know if that pain is from the shoulder or is that pain from me winding up the nerve? What, do you, what, what needs to be done next? Ask them to describe their pain. Okay. Um, I would describe it as, you know, it, it's achy, it's sore. It feels, it feels just like I feel when I'm driving and when I'm doing a push-up. It's my same pain. Move the head. Exactly, yeah. So if it's a shoulder thing and I move my head away, my shoulder thing shouldn't get any worse. If I move it towards, it shouldn't get any worse. It shouldn't change. But if it's a nerve and I move my head away, it should get worse. I've tugged on that nerve, right? The other thing is I could just say, hey, what happens when you bend your wrist? Does it get better? If it gets better, we said, oh, I've slacked the nerve. I've wound the nerve up. I've slacked the nerve. I've wound the nerve up. So they call that, you know, trying to sensitize that test. So if someone has a positive test, A, what's the range? B, is it the location of symptoms? And C, how do I know it's nerve and not something else, right? Um, can you guys think of another place in the body where that's a really common where it's really not maybe it's an important thing to do when we do this nerve test because it's common to miss it. All right, what do you guys think? What's another area in the body, another nerve test, where it often what they feel might be mistaken for another structure? Slump test? Yeah, slump test or anything in the leg. You think about sciatic on the posterior side? People bend down, they feel a pull in their leg. People are like, oh yeah, my hamstring, it's my hamstring. I pulled my hamstring. Maybe it's the sciatic nerve. How about on the front side of the leg where people say, my quad, my quad, my quad, it really could be your femoral nerve, right? So lower quarter, we kind of really need to sensitize by moving the head, moving the ankle to see is this a muscle problem or a nerve problem? All right, good. So I think we've kind of hit that part home quite a bit. All right, so if I go back to...
Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've looked at our mobility, the cluster, neurodynamics. If we wanted to progress and look more at mm -hmm. right, associated associated impairments, all right, we looked mm -hmm. at movement faults. All right, hang on one second. Sorry, mm -hmm. can I interrupt you yep. really quick? Yep. Um, what if our patient isn't able to get into that uh, 90 degrees shoulder abduction and external rotation for testing the um, light tension tests? Okay. There's, there's what's called um, median nerve two, which is like a, a variation of it, where um, it's not what's used in the Weiner cluster, so that the research behind it isn't as good. Um, but instead of doing the shoulder abduction extra rotation first, that is the last, that's the last component of it. So hang on one second, let's first thing we're um, I'll stand up and show you in just a second. I'm just gonna do that. Okay. Um, perfect. Okay. So you would wind the, you'd wind the nerve up down here. So still full elbow extension, full external rotation, wrist extension, and then the last thing you would do is come up into abduction, and then see if that brings on because majority of the shoulder pathology is gonna hurt more up here. So that would be just a like you kind of do it the other way around. Um, and then same thing, you sensitize the wrist or you sensitize the, um, the head to see if it comes on. Cool. Okay, and just one more thing. And is there like another way to do a nerve slider if they can be in that position for like a media nerve slider? Instead of like the typical, this yeah. one up here? Yeah, if you, you can pin their arm to a wall, Let's see if I can do it, All right? So if I pin my hand lower down, it locks my wrist in more extension than I can do on my own. Right, so it's like, so I'm gonna get mast extension, my arms here, and then if I just kind of turn my body away, right, I go from flexion to abduction, flexion to abduction, right? The, it's the arm moving, and then you can always add your head to make it more sensitive, so you're not up here. But, because when you're up here, when we do sliders, a lot of times our wrists will never be in full extension, right? I can't extend my wrist fully here because everything's on tension. So you have to use something to pin it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. Dr. Lemoyne, can you please mute me, T. James? Yeah. Isn't that who was talking? No. Oh. Cool. Awesome. That's our Ireland friend, huh? 3 a.m. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, so if we, if we think about moving from diagnostic tests and movement tests, it's more impairments. We already talked about thoracic mobility. Right, so hands behind your head, going up, trying to measure extension, deep neck flexors, looking at some of the muscles that cross nearby, looking at the scapular muscles, looking at pec length. So all the common things that we look at, right? If we had to rank these, right? If someone comes in with neck pain, radiating pain, right? And you're able to get it with right rotation, right extension, where should our first treatment probably be focused on? Entrapment site reduction. Exactly, which would be at the neck, right? So we'd probably, even though they probably have weak deep neck flexors and maybe they have poor scapular strength and pick minor stuff, right? Ideally, if it's a pretty clear thing, like when I move my neck and it hurts, I do that, it hurts. It's like, all right, is there something at the neck I can do to free that up, right? Or if I just correct their position, whether it's scapula, thoracic spine, and it gets better, great. We're going to work on just that stuff. That would be level one. These associated impairments, like looking at thoracic mobility, deep neck flexors, think of these as, hey, you know what, we've worked on the neck, it hasn't gotten better, what's driving it? Or B, hey, you're, it's gotten better, but this is why it started. Let's normalize these so it doesn't continue, right? So that would be it. And then differential we kind of talked about, right? If I come back to this one, right? With our differential, it's gonna be either TOS, or distal nerve, right? Those are the two most common. We already walked through the distal nerve. What would be those TOS tests that we might have to do? Ruse. Ruse, okay. And that's kind of a catch-all, right? Three minutes here. Does that bring on your symptoms, right? Pump out the blood. Good. What else? Adsense. Adsense, okay. And so Adsense, right? So 
kind of take pulse here, turn your head to the side. What are you testing? What, what entrapment site, whether it's nerve or vascular, what entrapment site are we looking at there with that test? Scaling. Scaling, yeah, All right. So kind of where the trunk comes out of it. Good, what else? Two, two more, two more. CJ and Shannon say military brace. Okay, so costal vicular or military brace. Yep, a couple different names for that one. Um, again, arm goes into abduction and then extension, head sit up tall. So what are we testing there? CJ says first rib. Yep, first rib and clavicle. Um, good, all right, and then last one. J.O. says hyperextension test. Yeah, so not, yeah, so abduction, hyperabduction, right? And here we're putting tension on pec, teres, more like muscular tension to bring that on. Good. Okay, so ruse, brachial plexus test. You guys know what the brachial plexus test is? No. Okay. It is like a, it is a palpation test, like your peripheral nerve stuff, except you find your suprascapular fossa. So you would stand behind the person, and your thumb would go. Oh, I do. Your thumb would go right above the clavicle into that super scapula and you just squeeze. So kind of like if you're squeezing someone's upper track, go inferior to that and you just squeeze there and see if that brings on their symptoms, right? Kind of need to be careful and be like, is that your symptoms that you feel? Because it's not comfortable, right? Just like if you guys ever pushed on each other's first ribs, not a comfortable test, but you're saying, does that bring on any of your familiar stuff? Good. I think you guys nailed AdSense, costoclavicular or the military. Um, hyperabduction, and then cervical rotation, lateral flexion. Right, there's an end there, that picture's covering it. I do know how to spell flexion, I swear. <laughs> um, that one, right? So you're kind of turning and then going down, right? You're looking for mobility. What are we testing mobility of? First rib height from Chris Juarez. Yeah, so if I turn left and go down, I'm checking first rib on the right. So you think about it, if I turn it, it kind of the scalings put tension on the scalings, the scalings pull it up, and then it would doesn't move as well. All right. Good. All right. So that would be all of our testing, right? We already talked about red flags, right? Red flags being any of our nystagmus or our upper motor neuron clonus, stuff like that, VBI. Um, right. Is there any other um, is there any other information that you might get from a patient that might tell you this is not the typical neck pain with radiating pain, right? Think of um, a common differential for someone that has neck pain with arm pain that we don't see as often, but we definitely see it. Something we haven't talked about yet. How if the patient says, you know, yeah, I got this arm pain. You know, it's actually, it's on both sides. Um, I can't really button my shirt. I feel like I'm a little, I feel like I've been losing my balance more often. All right, so now we start thinking about cervical myelopathy, right? Where the spinal cord is no longer a nerve root, but it's actually the spinal cord itself is being irritated or impinged. Um, so it's, again, something we want to look at with that. Good. Okay, so let's move on to interventions, right? The thing patients like the most. Okay, so. Intervention, if we're thinking manual therapy, if it's someone who's really acute and working in entrapment site reduction, right? It may be traction. It's going to be just gentle mobilizations to that spot, right? Um, it may be working on muscle PIRs. So you think about if someone has a big acute nerve irritation, those muscles on the neck start to get tighter. If I already have something being pinched by the joints being pinched, irritating the nerve, and then you're gonna throw some muscles on top to pull down on it, that's just gonna make it worse, right? So we might need to work on just gentle stuff. If it's subacute or chronic where it's not that irritable, now we can start working on more physiological mobility, right? So whether it's up glides, down glides, side glides, right? Um, so this is the patient supine and it's just moving the joints the way that the neck would move if you're either turn or side bend, right? A lot of the studies and the guidelines talk about side glides being the, um, being the most recommended I don't want to say the word best, but the most recommended for neck pain, radiating pain. So some of the cervical radic, that supposedly gets more nerve mobility, maybe not necessarily joint mobility, but more nerve mobility at those segments. 
right? So, but again, the idea is that you assess them, up glides, side glides, down glides, and see which one is the stiffest. Right. Good. So accessory mobilities would now be the person prone, and we're doing PAs, right? So and this is to the cervical spine, right? Maybe we want to work on upper thoracic mobility, right? The nice thing is if it's a nerve entrapment in the neck, we can be a little bit more aggressive at the T-spine, right? So we can do grade fives or high velocity thrusts, right? Um, so whether it's working on the upper T-spine here for this one, this one is working more on thoracic mobility. So whether it's the general prone manip, seated manip, maybe some extension snags, right? Um, PAs, right? So we have a lot of treatments that are focused on the thoracic spine. And the nice thing is there's a lot of research that says treating the thoracic spine helps people with neck pain, whether it's acute neck pain, chronic neck pain, or radiating arm pain, right? Um, quick question, Dr. Lemoyne, going back to the side glides. If the patient has right side of the neck um, pain, mm -hmm. are you doing then left, left sided side glides? Yes. You are, okay. if the, the pain's on the right, you're going towards left your to right. Yes. Yeah. You're doing that way, which is relatively right. If opening, I'm opening up that side. Yeah. So it's opening it up. So in the clinic though, if you're doing that and you're pushing on this side and the pain's on this side, we hope to feel it on this side. The other thing you do is come on this side and then do up glides on that side. So you can open it with rotation on the same side or open it with side bend on the other side. But the studies that they found were more of the side glide stuff. Awesome. Cool. Good question. Good. Okay. So subacute, we're looking at more aggressive at the neck, more aggressive at the thoracic, upper thoracic, mid thoracic. And again, what would make us want to treat the thoracic spine? It's during our objective exam, that person's symptoms got better when we pushed them into extension or when we PA them, they're very stiff there, um, right? Something led us to go away from this neck to treat the thoracic spine, right? And then neurodynamic mobility, right? So acute, subacute, chronic, right? So you think about we have acute, maybe very low level, where we're just moving one body part. So my arm might be straight, I'm just moving my wrist. My shoulder, my elbow, everything else is slack, right? I might even be moving the other side, right? There's some articles that talk about doing sliders and tensioners on the opposite side is helpful for the nerve roots on the painful side, right? So if they're really acute, um, maybe about two weeks ago, I had someone who just laying down supine, totally fine, just asking them to dorsiflex, right? Just laying flat, sort of brought on their radiating leg pain, right? So it's pretty... Um, Pretty irritable, right? I didn't even get to, so it's like a zero, straight leg raise is zero, right? It's kind of what it was. Um, so then really I wasn't gonna do many sliders with her, right? So we kind of just put her in a position of comfort and I had her work the other leg pretty aggressively with a sheet, like going all the way up in the straight leg raise to just decrease her resting pain and try to get the nerve to calm down. Right? If we're doing subacute, right? It's gonna be more sliders. Sliders meaning as I put tension on it, if my wrist is here, if I put tension on, then my head's going to go towards to slack it. As I come up, I might slack my wrist to go away, right? So you have different types of exercises, whether it's the neck, the shoulder, the hand, as long as you're saying you're not tensioning both at the same time. You always slack one end while the other side's on tension, right? right. This would be our tensioners. So now with our tensioners, we are putting the whole entire system on tension. So I would side bend away, wrist extension, and go into full elbow extension, come up, full elbow extension up, or even maybe just go wrist here, wrist, here. but I'm, everything is on tension, right? Good, so someone who we're not worried about inflammatory stuff, we're not worried about them not having problems sleeping, it's really, it's like, oh, if I sit on my computer for a while, if I turn my head, I'm fine, if I turn my head a bunch of times, I'll feel it, those are the kind of the, the person. Um, person that you pull their arm, it's really tight, yeah, it hurts a little bit, but it's just more it's lacking range. Good. All right. Okay. So that would be our manual therapy, right? Our Therex is going to match it, right? So either we're working on mobility of the neck, mobility of the nerves, or associated impairments like pec mobility, thoracic spine mobility, stuff like that, right? So you have these options that just match it, right? Coordination. This is going to be where we're working more on interregional dependence. So the deep neck flexors, motor control for those movement faults, 
So if someone has a scapular depressed, a depressed scapula, what are some exercises to work on improving scapular elevation? If someone has a lot of thoracic kyphosis, what are some exercises to improve thoracic kyphosis, right? So um, scapular strength. So it's kind of trying to match the impairments you feel. Right? Right, so here's our interventions for acute, right? Neurodynamics, sliders versus tensioners. We talked about that. Our entrapment site reduction, right? So doing self mobilizations, towel traction, right? Working on nerve mobilization and then improving some of the associated impairments, pec, thoracic spine, et cetera. Good. Deep neck flexor strengthening, scap strengthening, kind of more like just overall postural stuff. I would say though, a lot of people have weak scapulas. A lot of people have weak deep neck flexors, right? Pretty much across the board, majority of people. So the idea is, do we really want to spend time strengthening these um, if we don't know if they're related to their problem? So I would say before I spend time strengthening some of deep neck flexors, I really want to make sure that if they get them stronger, it's going to help their problem, right? Do I want to invest my time and have the patient invest their time in this working on something? that I, I want to make sure that they work on something that I know is going to help them. So I will be their fake deep neck flexors. I'll put their head there. I'll hold it there, have them retest whatever it is. And then if it's better, I can make, all right, I'm pretty confident if you can get these stronger, you'll get better, right? Same thing with the scapula. If I put your scapula in a better position, and then you retest your neck or you retest your arm and it feels better. Now I'm like, you know what? It's worth that challenge. To get you stronger for those muscles because we kind of proved it. Right? And patients tend to have more buy-in as well. All right, so I'll go back to here. All right, so Therax functional. If we kind of go back a page to patient education, right? JOSPT has a lot of patient educations about manipulations in neck pain, um, quicker recovery with just neck movements overall. Uh, work-related injuries and neck pain related to depression. Um, exercise and manual therapy for your neck leads to quicker reductions, right? So there's lots of, and then also through PhysioU, we have some of the um, patient education neck. We have some uh, patient education stuff as well, right? So cervical radiculopathy, what can you do for neck pain, radiating arm pain? Right? Three minute video or read, and it talks a lot about some of the common symptoms, right? So working on some of the common mobility stuff for the nerve, right? Traction if they're irritable, right? So nice thing is this can just be an easy email to your patients. All right. So right. in modalities, right? So if we think modalities, right? The one that research supports the most is traction, right? But based on some of the things we work on, if someone feels better with scapular unloading, we can always tape their scapula. If someone feels better with thoracic extension, we could tape them into thoracic extension, right? Um, chronic neck pain, there's some research that talks about using TENS for neck pain. Um, however, I'd be careful with this in the sense that um, long-term outcomes aren't very good. They're more for acute in the moment. Um, and then the longer-term ones that show to be a little bit better are if they're doing TENS to do something active. So I have neck pain and I do tends to sit in the chair and it feels better, right? Very, very short term, right? Versus my neck hurts when I'm walking, my neck hurts when I'm right, doing some stretches. All right, put your tens on, you feel better, and then you do your activity, right? So you're using tens as a way to be more active and the being active is what will help you long term. Versus, I hope that kind of makes sense. Right? And then ice or heat. Right? Again, we don't want to use heat on an acute nerve irritation, but if it's more of a muscle tension, chronic -y, nerve isn't inflamed, heat can help relax things, so then it moves better. Right? Nerves do better with blood flow and oxygen, and sometimes heat can help with that stuff. I think that is it. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing for a second. All right, so... Any, uh, any questions about kind of cervical radiculopathy or neck pain, radiating arm pain? Um, I know it's a, the nice thing about it is it's very straightforward in the sense of, oh, entrapment site reduction, move the nerve. Like very early on, it's like, if you can identify something stuck in the neck, treat it, it gets better. So that's maybe 50% of them, right? 
The other 50%, there's something driving that entrapment site. And that's where we need to look at those are the people that don't get better in three to four weeks. But now they're looking at like a couple months. It gets, the symptoms get a little better, but they still get it when they do things. And now you start thinking about what movement fault is driving this, right? And I kind of give them the idea. If you bump your elbow on the table and you get this funny bone thing, it shoots for a second. Do you have to do anything to make it go away? Or do you just kind of have to protect the nerve for a little bit, right? Nothing, right? Maybe you shake it out. That's your nerve mobs. Maybe you flex your elbow, extend your elbow. That's your entrapment site reduction, right? That's what we're working on. And it kind of gets better, right? But sometimes if I keep banging my elbow every single day, right, I can't just expect it to get better with just doing those things anymore. So I have to figure out a reason why. So that would be the, hey, you're sitting like this, or hey, you're always on the phone like this. You're sleeping in a weird position. Um, yeah, so hopefully that kind of makes sense uh, as far as like how to a very easy case and then a much harder case where you have to start to treat associated impairments like scapula and deep neck flexors. Um, the question we have in the chat, how would you, uh, how would treatment change for the central, uh, central sensitized patient? patient? So you're talking like persistent pain, like they have um, more than just localized nerve irritation, right? just to make sure that the word central, the same central I'm thinking of? Yes. Okay. Um, so it would still be nerve sliders, right? Because anytime the nerve can move, it decreases sensitization, right? So that's not going to change. Um, the things that would change would be, what are all the other things that are filling up that person's bucket? So I talk about people have a big bucket, right? And you have to, in that bucket is sleep, stress, anxiety, physical activity, fear, avoidance of movement, catastrophization all these other things that make our system, right? Just in generally more central, uh, more, more sensitized, right? So the word central meaning it's not local to my tissue, it's more upstairs and just maybe your whole allostatic load. So what are the things you're doing to make your system overall better? So I'll ask them about sleep and talk to them about sleep habits, physical activity, right? What are you doing for just general activity? Are you walking, are you on a stationary bike? Um, are they fearful to move? Are they fearful of their pain? Right. I'll talk about the fact that, Hey, we need to talk a lot about like neuro pain education, stuff like that. So the one thing that wouldn't change is nerve sliders, but the way I talk to them, it's not going to be this nerve is trapped in your neck and we have to open the space up to get your nerve to move better. We got to change your posture. Now it's going to be, there's things in your life that are making you not be able to handle very much. Your bucket is already full of all these things. You have no room. You have no room left. We need to make more room. How do we make more room so your nerve hurts, so you hurt less? What are the things you can change today to make your whole entire system less stressed? Right. Um, and that, that is, a, again, a much harder person to treat. Um, but the nice thing is hopefully you don't have to treat all those things. Hopefully one of those or two of those seven things they already are fine with. Like, oh, I'm not stressed at all and I sleep 10 hours. But I'm very, very fearful and I'm a catastrophizer and I'm depressed. Okay. So we only have to tackle those. And I don't want to say only because those are hard things to tackle. Good question, though. Who wrote that question? Uh, J.O.? Oh, J.O. I wouldn't expect anything better than that. Nothing. Um, yeah, cool. Any can other? We, I also followed up with that. Can we, um, can we be, uh, basically be aggressive with Therex? Them. You can be aggressive with Therics if the patient lets you be aggressive with Therics. So if they're okay with the understanding that when they feel pain, they're not damaging themselves. So hurt does not equal harm, right? Pain is danger and alarm. Pain is protection. Pain is not damage. So if they're open to that and they understand that and they're willing to work through pain with the idea that I'm not damaging myself, I'm building a bigger bucket. I'm scooping water out of my already full bucket. Totally. But the person that's fear avoidant, catastrophizer, right? You have to make sure they're on your side and you have a good therapeutic alliance to do that. So that normally doesn't happen day one, right? Um, or day two or day three. <laughs> um, but uh, that's something you definitely want them to work towards. If you can get patients to be involved with that, then we can definitely work on improving their conditioning, which means their tissue can handle more and they'll be a lot less fearful to move, right? It's funny though, I have a person now, low back pain, not neck, back, who in the clinic, Right, he's picking up a 50-pound kettlebell now. Like we worked with, he's doing squats and deadlifts with a 50-pound kettlebell, 
He's totally into it. He's sweating. He's excited. But yet he goes home to pick up a trash and his back hurts when he has to take the trash out. Dude, your trash is not 50 pounds, <laughs> right? Guaranteed something. But it's the idea of this neuro tag in his brain that says, oh, I'm working out here in a clinic. Back doesn't hurt. Here I'm doing some chore at home that hurt my back six months ago. And this still bothers me every time, right? And it's not like a mechanic thing because this is the guy that's, this is the guy that's like super nerdy on mechanics. He thinks every time he hurts, it's because mechanics aren't perfect. So he tries to have perfect mechanics almost too much, almost to a fault, you know? Um, so it's trying him to get him to just be okay with, hey, your back is hurting because of the environment, not because of the tissue. It's not the tissue that is being damaged right now. It's the environment of taking out the trash, right? Um, and so hopefully he's going to get into that. That was, his report, that was his complaint this week when he came in is that he feels like he's better, but then he has these flare-ups when taking these taken out to trash. But it's not really a true tissue flare-up, it's a centralization sensitivity flare-up. Cool. You got some more uh, questions to follow that up with. What is your take related, on- Related to like neuro pain education? Yeah, we got one question with that and another question a little bit going That's back. That's a whole another webinar. That's another two, hour, it's two hour webinar. Yeah. Okay. Um, what is your take on PNE, and is there evidence? But still seems like there. Uh, uh, still seems like some think it's not worth the time. Oh. Um, there is lots and lots of evidence out there. Actually, I'm currently going through a um, a program through South Australia where, like, I have class twice a week um, on neuropain education and um, with like uh, Mosley and David Butler and stuff like that. So it's really cool. Um, but that's all we do is they just present literature after literature after literature. So tough to listen to sometimes after a full day of work, but uh, it's, it's, it's good that, they're pre that they have all this literature to, to present all the changes in the brain, changes in the spinal cord, change in sensation, and then trying to now make it more clinical based. Like how do we work on patients? The hard thing is, is every chronic patient is independent. They're an N of one because they all have their own drivers, right? Their own driver of what stresses them out, what, uh, how emotionally fragile are they? What is their phenotype for what their system can handle? Um, right? Financial situation, family situation. So there's a lot of things. So I would say you can, you can choose to not do it early on and try to treat patients biomechanically and what we'd call the biomedical model. We're going to treat your tissue. Um, and that is definitely an easy way out. But you have to think about we fail, right? 85% of those people that are chronic and centralized are going to fail, right? There are going to be some that, they start working out, they feel better, they get that, they get some endorphin rush and they kind of run with it and they didn't really need tons of NPE. But majority of people are going to fail if they have central sensitization, peripheral sensitization, um, and we just treat them musculoskeletally and that's it, um, they're not gonna fail or they're not gonna succeed. They're still gonna have pain and those are the people that five, six, seven years later, more and more and more. So the hard thing is, as therapists, even people who are really well trained and they've gone through extra and extra classes, we still fail 60% of the time. So really, if you don't try, it's 85% fail. If you try hard, we can help a third of the people, right? So it's, it's, it's tough, but we're hoping that big picture is five years from now, you have more people have an understanding of it. So when I talk to my patient about your pain is protective and it's an alarm system and your alarm system is too sensitive, right? it's not damaged. And then you go see your physician and your acupuncturist and your chiropractor and your physical med, your physical med doc. And they're all telling you, Oh yeah, that disc in your spine. Yeah. That disc, I can see it there. So now you have seven people telling you disc, this, this damage, damage, damage. Don't bend forward. Now I'm trying to tell them, Hey, it's okay to bend forward. So I think that's where we, we struggle. Um, and we need to make sure that everybody is kind of understand we're no longer doing this Rene Descartes model model of, we have pain sensors in our tissue. It's really more of this, no, no, it's a mature organism model where it's, it's our brain that determines everything, right? No brain, no pain. So, but again, I would say those are, maybe that's, a, maybe those, that's something we can talk about more on a, another webinar. I'll do a chronic pain one or some persistent pain because that's a, that's a deep topic. Follow that up um, with the, with someone who has a cervical neck fusion is having ridiculous symptoms, can you, can you still manually move the cervical spine? Um, or how, how would you say, how would you address manual therapy for that patient? I, um, I think it, so it depends where they're at, right? So normally they wear the brace for the first six weeks. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't go in and then do anything more than what they do on their own. So they take the brace off, they do their gentle range. 
but you know, by, by eight weeks, right? You think about that bone is pretty firm. I'm going to go and do passive range with that person, right? I may do, if they're really painful and they have some central, I may do like grade ones to that localized tissue just to get them, just to get them to feel what it feels like because that in itself can decrease pain, right? They're very fearful, right? People have no idea what happened to them. Um, I had this one lady who had a fusion and was having nerve pain, tons of this, and she was kind of becoming more persistent. Um, like it was going to be called like a failed fusion thing. Um, it's like, and she was so sensitive. Anytime I got anywhere close to her neck, she would just freak out and tense up. Um, and eventually I asked her like, like, I don't know exactly how it came up, but finally like, why, like, you know, you're really sensitive and it's, you know, and it's uh, something that is maybe starting to maybe affect how we would treat you and that. And um, what, what are some issues? Like, why do you think this is so sensitive after this far out? And she said, I'm like, have you seen it back there? It's this huge scar. It's all this tissue. And she had, she had no idea what it looked like. So, and she actually had a really good incision. So I ended up just taking a picture of it and showing and say, this is your incision. This is what it looks like. Right. But she ever, all she ever saw was like this kind of mixed up, you know, like you try to look at the back of your neck sometimes. So it's like a mirror to a mirror to your neck. And it was weird. And so it was all crooked. And so she had this idea that it was like purple and crooked and all scarred and keloid. And so a lot of it, she just very thought that it was not healed well at all. And really it was a very nice tissue. So it was just her understanding and perception of it. Um, but sorry, totally off tangent. Going back to the question. Uh, yes, it's okay to move their neck. We want to move their neck because that makes them less sensitive. We just don't necessarily want to, we don't want to move it more than they're comfortable moving it in the first kind of six to eight weeks. Let them do it on their own. Um, a lot of times you're not even going to see these people in the first six to eight weeks, right? They don't come in right there. They wait and they're just in protective mode with their brace on. And um, I would say if they had a lot of nerve pain prior to their fusion, which normally they do, we definitely want to get the nerve to move um, because even though they've cleaned it out and they've maybe did a fusion to where the nerve isn't compressed anymore, you think that nerve hasn't moved well in who knows how long, right? It had a lot of inflammation. So there's a lot of this like gunkiness on it. So we still can do that right away and move that. Good question. Awesome. I'd say that's one of the biggest things is people have this neck surgery and then afterwards, like when you see them, they're in shock that their pain didn't go away, right? Kind of like your total knees. I have knee pain, I had surgery. They told me my pain would be better. I have all this pain, right? So it's our job to say, totally normal. You had a big surgery, right? They had a cut into you, right? Surgery, they, they drilled into you. They did all these things. I try not to say they were drilled in them. That might make it worse, right? You had a big surgery. They, um, they fixed some things in there. They made things better. But in that process, right, it's very painful. And they didn't fix your nerve, right? Your nerve really was just being compressed. It's no longer compressed, but it's still very unhappy. So just because your nerve is right, decompressed doesn't mean your nerve all of a sudden feels pain-free. You still have to do some work. So it's just making it less fearful for them. Cool. Any, awesome. uh, any other questions, guys? Or you think, I think that's it. Thank you guys for coming. As always, I appreciate it. Especially, uh, I know there's something else stuff going on tonight. Um, yeah. So in, I think the next one is the 20th, right? So in a couple of weeks, I, I already checked to make sure there's no uh, presidential, presidential debate. That's the 22nd. So we'll be, um, and that will be the overhead athlete. So we'll kind of switch from maybe a pathology specific, like we did the last two weeks, lumbar and neck, and more and more maybe a, a demographic or a topic. Cool. All right. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, guys.